How long have we got? I've got my clock here. How long have we got? We've got um, up to an hour. Done. One hour it is. Let's go. Um, so we'll just play it by ear. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So welcome to Small Business Financial Freedom. My name's Susan Crichton. And tonight, or today, my um, guest is Brad Burton. So I'm just going to read Brad's bio, because I think it's really interesting. So 1973 born, Salford, dad left, primary school, BMX bikes, role-playing role games, computer games, class clown, no qualifications, shop boy, girls, chalet cleaner, night clubbing, weed, more girls, games journalist, became a dad, shot at, moved to Somerset, depressed, dole, more weed, shop manager, blagged CV head of marketing, dole, director, Oxford, sucked, Oxford sucked, dole, three days away from bankruptcy, dad again, depressed, masonette above a chippy, which is interesting, I'll talk to you about that, married, employed, Shove job arse, self-employed, depression, skint, 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 whinging wife, <laughs> mm. dad again, four networking, stopped smoking pot, bluffing, struggling, speaking, author, still skint, 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 dad yet again, 5,000 plus events a year, oh ho, UK's number one mot motivational business speaker, Bought Dream Range Rover, still waiting to be found out. Sold Dream Range Rover. Author again, people are buying them. Scratch his head. Stabbed in the back twice. Burned out, near divorce, crisis averted. Just snapped up by top publisher for third book. Still waiting to be found out. Dad again, a daughter this time, oh ho. Mm -hmm. Audi driver. Brad Camps, Ferreira Roche, Buzzing, Blue Tick, Blue Tick, more five stars on Amazon, still UK's number one motivational business speaker, time to quit, now what? Fourth book, no longer skint, no longer depressed, actually quite balanced and happy, wife still whinging. So that sums it up. <laughs> <laughs> now, what's crazy about that is listening to that. I remember when I wrote that, and I'm so glad that I captured that because you know that was. I'd looked at all these bios, and all the bios are how clever everyone is, and this that, and the other. I thought well, that's not the real the real world. I could do a, a bio about how clever it was, but there's not the real story, and that is the real story, and it's the real story. I think my story is everyone's story. I think the difference is I'm stupid enough to share it. I think that's reality. Yeah, a lot of people. A lot of people don't have the confidence to share it, or they they need to they need to feel comfortable with you before they can share it. Of course. So I wanted to talk about some of the things that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Shally cleaner. Yeah. What the hell is that? So I worked at Butlins. Um, oh, in, yeah. I was thinking you were in somewhere like Switzerland. No, oh no, 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 I'm from like Zoltan. Shally cleaners. Yeah, I don't think I left the country. The country since I was twenty two. But you know, so I am. Um, no, I worked at Butlins in Minehead, which is funny enough, it's like literally 45 minutes from where I live now, but I clean chalets. Oh, right, okay. Mm -hmm. I did the same when I was a student. I did um, the halls of residence in Edinburgh. I, yeah. cleaned, I cleaned the rooms there because they let it out over the summer to um, tourists and things yeah. that came to Edinburgh. And the best ones were the Japanese. It left it immaculate. And, and also, they used to leave you little gifts under their pillows. Beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. it was beautiful. Well, I love a bit of humanity, and I think that's yeah. a, I think that's the thing that's been lost over the certainly in the last twenty years. It feels that way that that we've kind of lost the community with um with each other. And I think you know it's funny. It depends on where this conversation goes, but I don't believe social media is social anymore. I think it's weaponized, and I think that um you know from a Japanese culture perspective, just beautiful. Yes. Yeah. Well, what shocked me was they must have taken them with them from Japan because it was all little things it's from awesome. Japan that they put under the pillow. Anyway, so I've got J games journalist. Mm. So that so, was that a dream job? It was. I am. Um, I was twenty, eighteen, nineteen, nineteen, twenty year old, and I got a job um, writing for the computer game magazines. And in fact, 
if your audience want to go and Google Brad Burton Games Master, you'll see me with PJ and Duncan back in 1993 on Channel 4's Games Master show. I was um I was I used to do the reviews the reviews on the TV show. So yeah, I, I, you know I um it's amazing when you look at my life uh, the, the some of these glimmers of what my life could have been. And yet it wasn't because I actually screen tested for a um, to be a presenter on Sky Television. Um, oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I got down from the 18 down to the final three. But back in the day, I used to speak a little bit like this. I kid you all right. And it was a little bit, you know, my, my voice wasn't <laughs> right fit. But, you know, it just shows you. So obviously somewhere along the way, I've always had a little bit of flair for performing. Yeah, yeah. I've got head of marketing. Blagged <laughs> my way into head of marketing. It's a true story. So back in 1997, I got a job as a um, uh, as a shop manager, and this is an independent retailer. They got um, they had 12 stores, and my shop was one of the smallest. Yeah, I turned over more money in the small shop, not in the high street, um, and they couldn't understand why I was doing twice as much sales as any of the other ones in the branches. And they made me a regional leader. I got a job as a regional leader, lasted another year or whatever. And then I blagged my way into a job as head of marketing for the, an ISP back in the dot-com boom days called UK Online. And I um, I did beautifully there. You know, I had no idea what I was doing, but that naivete was what kind of served me in business because I did things mm. the likes of which no normal business person would do. And it's a trait that I've carried with me throughout my career. Yeah, that's good. Um, I've got a director, but you didn't say a director of what? Yeah, I was a director of a company called Hi2 over in Oxford. I um I was getting headhunted week in, week out. I was getting jobs offered to me. This was a dot-com boom, and it was a buyer's market, effectively. It was crazy. And eventually, the, uh, the company that I was working at, UK Line, I was doing beauty flair. The management over in London, PLC, brought in some mid-manager to look after me or, or between me and the director, and I just couldn't get on with them. I left instantly and I got a job over in um, in Oxford and, uh, you know, I, I got a relocation bonus of five grand and I didn't even buy a bed. Uh, that's how I kind of wasn't committed to it. I had an inflatable bed and after six months I went, you know what, I'm done. And I actually got out of there. Mm. You didn't like Oxford then? No, because once again, it was change. And, uh, you know, my what, wife, she was at Somerset and this, yeah, it just, just didn't allow. And this is the thing, I think, what I wanted to do is I wanted, and this has been a, a constant theme throughout the first maybe 35 years of my life is I wanted to go back to a time and a place that no longer existed. And actually, I think we're all guilty of that. That's where life becomes problematic is we're trying to get back to something that didn't, you know, that didn't happen. So, um, yeah, I, I didn't, it didn't work for me. It didn't work for me. Okay. So what saved you from bankruptcy? You said you were close to bankruptcy and what saved you? I had, um, I had three days three days um, where I give myself a date that if I didn't get a job by that date, I was unemployed, I would go bankrupt. So I'd give myself a six month window, three days before that, that deadline was due to happen, I got a job, um, which is the job prior to me starting my own business off. Okay. So you mean you mean bankrupt in that you had lots of debts? You weren't bankrupt for a business or anything like no, that? No, 25 grand worth of, of, of personal debt. And, yeah. you know, 25 grand of debt on credit cards and daft cars and daft TVs that are no longer owned. And, you know, it's just like I say, the, the kind of working class trap that you kind of fall, you know find yourself in. Chasing chasing something that um, you think is going to make you happy. <laughs> I think everyone, you know, the, the problem is with what you chase runs away. And something I've realized that if you've got a lot of chickens and this is what director teams that I mentor at the moment, you know, they're trying to go back to a time and a place that no longer exists pre pandemic time. And consequently, they, um, you know, they're running after these, these chickens and they're running away. And I've stopped doing that now. And what I do is I coo 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 with, with chicken feed, allow things to come to me. It's a complete change. And it's, it's a, it's, it's, it's a different approach to what, this kind of, you know, this 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 hustle and grind culture that has been kind of introduced into the certainly younger generation. It's a counterintuitive, but yet it's a whole lot more effective. Okay. So when did you actually go self-employed? Mm -hmm. Literally six months or so after that point where I um I got the job. Um December the 18th, 2004, told my employer to shove the job up their ass. And I walked out on a point of principle. I walked out of a um of a job on a point of principle. This was the uh, one in Oxford, was it? No, it was the one in London. So it was the oh, one. Okay. 
Yeah, yeah. And um, I walked out of the job and I, um, it was a wonderfully liberating experience. It really was for those three hours whilst I drove home and married. And um, <laughs> my, my, wife, my wife wasn't happy with that decision. Uh, and I opened the door, I'm standing outside the door and my blood's gone cold, realising the reality. I've opened the door and standing before me was eight and a half stone of common sense. She says to me, my wife, she says, you're home early. Are you here to look after baby Ben while I go shopping? That's one way to look at it, Kerry. The other way is I've told my employer to shove the job up the backside. <laughs> um, so my wife, she's still my wife, she's downstairs. Um, she was, um, you know, she was furious with my decision and she wanted me to go and get a proper job, at least you know where you stand, etc. Anyway, started my business off and... Um, it all worked out. It's, it all worked out. If I'd never walked out of that job, I'd never have started a business. You and I wouldn't be speaking. I wouldn't travel the world as a motivational speaker. I wouldn't have written four books. And I think that that's the really the interesting thing about all this is the worst day of my life. I got shot at in Manchester when I was 21 years old and um, caused me to move away to Somerset. And actually, if it wasn't for the worst day of my life, none of this would have happened. So everything happens for a reason, even the shitty stuff. And sometimes, you know, sometimes it... Um, it needs 20 years in the rear view mirror for it all to make sense. Yeah. So some of my um, listeners will be either just starting up just now or maybe are just in the early sort of stages of a business. Yeah. What would you say to them? What have you learned when you went self-employed? <clears throat> it's going to take you four times longer than you believe it's going to take. Okay. Four times, four times longer than you believe it's going to take. It, um, if your only motivation is money, it's not enough. Um, and, and also, um, not everyone's going to have the same values as you. No. So I'm, I'm a man of my word. If I say I'm going to do something, it happens, and not everyone's the same. No. I find that really hard, Brad. I find that really hard. That's still sort of, that's the biggest thing that I find hard because people are forever ever letting you down mm -hmm. and you think i would never do that i would never do so, why do they do that so people are flawed and i think that the you know you've got to be responsible for yourself and actually i used to give people three chances and every single person i've ever given three chances will take those chances one two three so i give people one chance now that's it that's the reality of it you know yeah. and um yeah so but i think once you accept that people are flawed and fallible, life becomes a whole lot easier. Maya Angelou says, if people show you who they are, believe it. I think that's quite good. Beautiful. So if, if you see, if somebody shows you what they're like, then believe it. Mm -hmm. Though I, I am a big believer in second chances. I am a believer in second chances. And I think everyone deserves a second chance, but hey-ho. Oh, listen, I mean, Christ, the amount of things that I've done wrong and actually I've got I've had second chances. But I just think when you, you know, I'm, I'm 50 now. And actually what I've realised is that, you know, the Brad that I am today isn't the Brad that I was 10 years ago. And actually I've changed, I've changed. And I think when people keep doing the same thing and don't change, that's when, when, when it becomes kind of problematic. Yeah. Yeah. And I think as a business owner, you have to change. Mm. I mean, I, I've only, this is my eighth year in business. And if I think back to when I started and what I'm like now, it's like chalk and cheese. And I was yeah. a bit like you. I left, I, I left a job and I thought I'm an accountant. I thought, oh my God, I'll, you know, I'll walk into another job. Right, right. And um, I'd, I'm fussy. I couldn't find what I wanted. Right. So I decided, okay, I'll just become self-employed. Mm -hmm. But when I walked out of the job, I've got older sons. And right. my oldest son was like your wife. Mm -hmm. He sat around and said to me, because he wasn't living at home at the time, right. what, what the hell are you doing? What have you done? You've given up this job. Good job, good money. Yeah. What are you doing? And have you got money behind you? And how long are you going to be able to last? <laughs> and he asked all the sensible questions that I hadn't thought about because I just knew I wasn't happy where I was and I had to get out. Right. It's funny, isn't it? It's really but, funny. But, 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 you know, we find a way as human beings, you know, we don't, you're not going to starve to death. You're not going to lose your home. So what's the risk? The risk is if it doesn't work out, you're going to get a proper job, which is exactly where you started from. Yeah. So I think that, you know, so many people, so many people worry about, they catastrophize about what life's going to be like 
And actually we put our identity around the job and we're more than that. And I think that's once again, another problem of society that you are based on your business card and what your title says. Yeah. Yeah. But I also think not everyone's cut out to be self-employed. True story. Um, True story. Yeah. And I get a lot of clients and I usually, I'm usually quite good when I meet them for the first time and they tell me, I think, okay, you're not going to last. This isn't for you. But you can't, you can't say that to them. You've got to let them sort of find out for themselves. Absolutely. They've got to get punched in the face. They've got to get punched in the face to, 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 to realise that they don't want to get punched in the face. And I think it's a combat sport. And what I mean by that is you can go into the gym and you can punch a punch bag and you can look in front of a mirror. That's all very romantic. But actually, getting punched in the face is what real combat's about. And the same goes for, for business. You know, you've got to get to a situation where you've got no sales, where you've got a whinging partner, where you've got a bill that's due tomorrow and you don't have the money. Yeah. You've got to go through that and push through those things there. And I think what's interesting is that when I started my business off 19, um, 19 years ago, oh gosh, is that right? 19 years ago. Whoa. Anyway, when I started my business off 19 years ago, you know, I started off and I was juggling, juggling finances, emotions, da, 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 da. I thought I'd get to the point where I would I'd be able to sleep in it, you know, be yeah. holding the these, my office is running, everyone else is juggling, I just make money. It doesn't work like that. 19 years on, I'm still juggling. You know, I had a multi-million pound business at one point. The pandemic got rid of that. But, you know, I, I realised something that actually, even anyone who's who's made it, and I know lots of people who have made it in business, they're still working. So you go, why? What are you working for? What are you working for? You know, what is it about? What is it about? Um, they must love it. They must love it. No, no, there no, must but, be but, an element of love. Well, yes, but they wanted to get past that. They wanted to get past that. When you first start off, you want to just get past it. You go, oh, you know, I can't wait to get to the point where I can. And this is the bit that I've kind of understood now. When I first started, it was me. I had a team at one point of 800, uh, 10 full-time staff in my office in Taunton. And now it's just me. Yeah. And somewhere along the way, I'm living better with it just being me. I'm not making as much money as a business. As an individual, I'm making more. And actually, I think to myself, that's almost like a mental illness. Why would you want to build a big business up? What is it that, that is in a big business that you've not got now? Ah, but if you had a big business, you could you could what? Could play PlayStation games before this podcast today? We did that. Could go have a nap before this podcast today? Did that as well. Ah, but you could go to the gym. Did that. So what is it about having a big... So, and I'll tell you something. This is, I mean, it's counterintuitive to what we've all been told counterintuitive to what we've all been told um so like, like you know i've come full circle you know having come from a council estate and a butter mason that above a chipper about what's really important and what's really important is my dad went at 53 i'm 50 so on that basis i've got three years left am i really going to go and spend that last three years probably longer but it might not be um ne next three years building up a business to do what with and i think like i say you can only feel that way um you can only feel that way if if you've been there and done it yeah. and got the t-shirt yeah yeah which is why um i talk a lot about financial freedom because mm -hmm. i talk a lot about um you know when you're in business yeah it's great to have all like you said all the money and to have the staff and all the rest of it but what you're actually looking for is some sort of financial freedom and financial freedom might mean different things to different people absolutely i mean right. it could so mean to you it could mean um being able to sort of have a nap in the afternoon. Yes. It could be to someone else being able to pick their kids up from school every day. Yep. yep. It could be um, having a month off in the summer to spend oh. with the family and know that the That's business right. is still going to survive. Right. And it could be to someone else having money in the bank and knowing well, that they're financially secure. No, but they're not, though. This is the thing. This is the bit. This is the bit. Right, which is actually really devastating because it puts people to the elements. Because you can have money in the bank, you can have properties, and all of a sudden a war goes off, all of a sudden a pandemic arrives, all of a sudden, and everything that you've worked towards 16 years, gone through no fault of my own. Yeah. None. So so I realized something. My business could have been a 10 million pound business, a hundred million pound business, and it was still gone. So on that basis. At 50 years old, I am going, this makes no sense. Yeah, yeah, but what happens if you go poorly, Brad? You've got no, okay. And what happens if a meteor from the planet Zog from 8 <laughs> billion light years away lands on me and kills me? I mean, you know, I just, I think we spend too much 
too much we're addicted to comfort and i think we spend too much time trying to protect ourselves from an, an enemy that never actually appears and that fear is what drives people and also keeps them stuck in their life and in their position why they believe that they need to work serious hours or build this business for this you know this this metaphorical security that doesn't exist and the sooner that people realize that no security exists, that Putin could have a nuclear warhead heading our way now, and all that work that you spent 60 years for is gone. You know, my wife, oh, what about your pension when you listen? If I'm still here, I worry about it in 20 years' time or whatever it is. I just I, I'm not that guy. I just I just think we spend too much time focused on what life looks like in 10 years' time and not at any time on what looks 10, 10 minutes that looks like. Maybe. So you're in the present, you're not in the future. Um, yeah, you're, no, not, you're not looking back. Well, no, there's a couple of things here. One, I um, where my life turned around is when I stopped living in the short term, okay? So okay. I was living in the short term. When I got shot at, I thought that I was never going to see another day on this planet, okay? Because I, 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 dangerous people I've met. So with that, I lived every day like it was my last, which is yeah. great until you wake up tomorrow and you days and you fucked up the night before. Yeah. So 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 but what I do say equally, if you look at that, is that I lived every day like it's my last because of the fear. I was living in the short term. I then moved to the medium and long term. Once you get through the short term uncomfortableness of, of that, you get to the medium and long term, you're sorted. So I'm now at the medium long term where I'm present with it. I'm I'm up alongside it. So I am, um, you know, I, I I've got no long term planning, none. And actually, because nobody knows. And then what I do know is my ability to be fleet of foot and move with any circumstance is, is good enough. So, you know, whether that's you'd have some expert in the in, in the Financial Times saying, well, you know, the, your fiscal policy on the couldn't give a monkeys what they think. It works for me. And this is what we need to understand in our life. Do what works for you. And if and if people don't agree with what you do, that's OK, as long as you're comfortable with your decisions, because ultimately that's what matters here, your decisions, because where we end up in our life, where we end up in our business is a direct result of our decisions. Want more success? Make better decisions. And does it work for your wife? <laughs> this this not, view of yours? No, no but, but equally, she's, you know, she's she's worrying all the time about nothing. You know, and what I mean by that is the great thing about worry is whatever you worry about never happens. So, you know, so she's a worrier. So she, yeah. you know, it wouldn't would make no difference what financial set of circumstances she'd worry. So, so <laughs> you see, we're in exactly the same boat. Everyone, and it's the yin and yang, everyone's got their, their, their upsides and downsides. My wife says that she's a worrier. I'm not. She'd suggest that, um, you know, that what was interesting, whenever things got tough, and things have been tough with the pandemic. You know, you go from a, yeah. a business that is £80,000 a month outgoings to having no income. That's a tough set of circumstances. But what I did say to her is I said, name one bill in the history of, you've known me 20 odd years now. Name one bill that I've not paid. Name one, I'll wait. Yeah. And she couldn't do it. So I said, well, why would why would this bill be any different? Uh, why? What? Why is this set of circumstances different to any of the preceding 20 years of worry that you give? And if it, and this is what I'm trying to say is we have this this kind of this disproportionate fear that is just made up. And we've got to stop that. I think what's interesting about this whole thing, uh, Susan, is I, um, I've stopped watching the news. I'm now two years in of not watching the news. I have no idea what's going on other than the occasional thing. Somebody saying, have you heard, you know, yeah. two, three weeks ago I was presenting. And, and and like everyone was was fearful. Oh, my gosh, there's a nuclear bomb coming our way. Putin's <laughs> I'm like, guys, are you serious? Right. I said, you know, so you're going to spend your day, the last day, if this is what it is, worrying about or like, so I just, you know, like I say, I'm, I'm, I think due to the nature of my, my life experiences, plus running a business network with thousands of members, I get to see people at the best. I get to see people at the worst. I've seen, uh, I don't think there's anyone in the UK that's had as many one to one conversations with various people as me. I just don't see it. I'm like Father Christmas when I was running my networking event. Um, so I get to see people at the best and the worst. And consequently, I also understand the best and the worst way that you can live your days. And worrying doesn't help anyone. It's not worth it. No. So you've written four books. Yeah. Um, one in 2009 and the last one in 2016. You haven't Correct. done anything since then. You got another one in planning? Yeah, I've got I've got a fifth book on my desktop right now, and um, you know, 
if there's any doubt, there's no doubt, and there's doubt about it as a book. So ordinarily with me, you know, I'm so decisive and, and, and assertive, and actually I'm looking at it and it's just something I, I think I've changed as an individual. I think I've changed so dramatically from when I started it. So these are 40,000 word books, um, <clears throat> 40,000 word books. Yeah. So I think what I'm going to go and do is I'm going to go to a 12,000 word book, which is a fraction, a quarter effectively of each of them and have it as a book that people can read within two hours. And actually, because I believe truly that I can change people's lives positive, positively in, in that sort of space of time. Um, and that's what I'm about now. I think, I think having gone, you, it, this in itself tells a story, get off your ass, get off your ass too is when yeah. I realized I could help people. Life business just got easier. And then now what? <laughs> that in itself is a narrative. Um, but I just think that my, if my book was going to be called, my next one would be called Life Maker. Um, and I've got a cover for it and everything. Okay. So which one should we read first or which one should we read? Yeah, I think that most people say that life business just got easier is my my best one. Okay. Um, you know, they're all genuinely of a level and they're almost like Star Wars films. You can read them and watch them in any order and you'll still make sense. But I would suggest life business just got easier or now what would be a starting point. Okay. So um, do you measure success at all then? Yes, contentment and happiness. That's you know, how you measure it? Correct. Nothing to do with money. I, I, when I when I managed, sorry, a mentor director teams, I go into certain boards and I kick ass in my own Broadway. And actually, they're telling me how, how all the gross margins are up. And that's fabulous. Can I just ask you another question? Bit off-centre, but let me just start it down. If we can all just write down on a scale of one to ten, ten being zippity dee da zippity fucking day, and one being miserable as sin, if you can just write down how happy you are and you can't write seven or five <clears throat> and actually get them all to turn a piece of paper over and then turn it over, and you'll see. You know, if everyone's really honest with themselves, this is the bit that eludes so many directors. We've had this, this metric of success, which is pound, shilling, and pence. And actually, that's great if you're happy. If you're unhappy and you've got lots of money, that's when you start doing dumb shit. Yeah. And I think that I just look at the, the the metric of what, you know, if we was born into a new world and everything that we existed that currently didn't exist, we wouldn't be on this basis. I think we're on a, I, 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 for me, having got, um, and this was a really interesting thing. I'm just looking, I've got a sheet here of it. But having got to a point in my life where, there you go. So this is what I call success mountain. Okay. This is one of my worksheets. Okay. Right. So when I talk to somebody, I say, oh, what's at the top of your success mountain that isn't a base camp or midway? And, and actually, it's really funny because they believe that happy is at the top when happy is right here, yeah. which is a little bit in the maze. But I'm being serious. Is we chase this thing. It's almost like a like a donkey with a carrot. You can never catch it. And the longer you run, the more tired you become. So I've kind of realized and it's our methodology to, to kind of help people find what really is their driving force and they think that by getting money and getting a big house and having a fast car that you will become happy and i had a big house lots of money and a fast car and i wasn't happy no and that was like shit this is this is odd this is, i've got everything yeah i had nothing yeah and actually i i was walking my dog tyson a labradoodle back in the day crying in 2012 to myself so what would have been um, 11 years ago, 39, crying out loud to myself, saying, I just want to feel normal. I just want to feel normal. I just want to feel normal. I'd lost every bit of my identity about who and what I was in pursuit of being a business success. Crazy. So do you wake up in the morning and you're happy and content? Yes. Default position, happy and content. It's not, you know, and it's almost like I say, it's almost like a mental illness because my wife thinks I'm crackers. But I said, look, you know. <laughs> you, you would <laughs> probably drive me and see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, 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 you know, you know, a positive mindset won't solve all your problems, but a negative one will give you more. Yeah. So I, I just look at the positive in everything. And and it's and also I accept what I mean by that is it doesn't sometimes things people, when they do you in or do you over, doesn't mean you've got to enjoy it or like it, but you've got to accept it at some point. You have to accept and move on. So are you going to say an ex-husband's, you know, slept with the babysitter, whatever, right? And all yeah. of a sudden you're furious, absolutely furious with that individual. Okay, you're furious. So what are you going to do about it? Well, I'm going to remain furious. Okay, until when? Well, until... 
<laughs> so, 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 if you think about it, and I'm going to give you a red hot coal and put it in your hand. You'd let go of it straight away. But in, t- in life, what we end up doing is we end up holding on to these things that burn and cause us pain because we can't let go of it. And they didn't attack you. And at some point, you got to let go. So just let go now. And that's what I've managed to find this kind of headspace, which allows me to do that. And I'm sure there are going to be times in my life in the future when I'm tested on that front. You know, let's not believe that I'm going to be all Harry Krishna throughout everything. I'm not that stupid. No. But where possible, ask yourself a question. Why are you holding on to this 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 thing that's causing you problems and pain? At what point are you going to let go or are you never going to let go? Well, that's good. So do you set yourself any goals at all? Um, Kind of, yeah, loose let. So you know those two penny arcade pusher machines that you put two pence in, it pushes yeah. That's what I do with goals. So I have a short-term goal that gets pushed off. It's the medium one becomes short, and I've always got three in any kind of um, you know going at any time. But but no, the days of me getting a big thing. Oh, I want a global success, and all that. I'm not even asked. I, honestly, there was a time when that's one of you know you said to me global network, the largest global network in the UK in the world. Pff, I couldn't think of anything worse anymore. I'm quite happy playing PlayStation games, going to the gym. That's like my garden. Sounds good. Sounds well, you know, good. no, but this is the thing. I think we, you know, you look at people with look at well, this amazing vista over in Dubai, and okay, <laughs> got an amazing vista over in Somerset. You know, I just I, it doesn't mean that. And this is somebody said, "Oh, you've got self limiting beliefs, Brad." I said, "You know what?" I said, "You look at Elon Musk; he's got self limiting beliefs. Freaking Mars pff, could go to Saturn." <laughs> you know, I mean. <laughs> this is what I'm trying to say. You get people just like I've got this 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 ridiculous worldview of of bigger and next is always the next thing, and it's not. At some point, where you are in your life is where you want it to be, and then you get there, and it's not enough. That's crazy. That's a mental illness. So your goals are evolving. Hmm. You set you set them short, medium, and long, as as I understand it. And once the short's gone, the medium moves up, and the long moves up, and then you set another long. Correct. And it's always in cyclic like that. But none of these, none of these. So, for instance, I've got something coming that nobody knows about, which I'll share with you. It's called um, uh, the Life Maker Retreat. So, my intent is to be running retreats using these worksheets. I've got literally eighty of them. Um, and actually, my intent is to is to there you go. Uh, my intent is to is to take people on a journey of self discovery, but also about business, about life, sorting their entire world out. But and here's the thing, running them every three to four months over in, um, you know, Ibiza or over in Ayanapa, whatever, five-star retreats um, for high self-worth individuals, <laughs> right? So it's not about, like, money, money, money. No. Um, but we're going to go and do that. And there's, there's two things there. One, it ticks the box of my personal development, and it allows me to build up a network of amazing people globally. But also it gives me a free holiday as well. Yeah. So, so somewhere along the way, it's not the most perfect opportunity ever. It works for me. It works for them. It works for everyone. So that's where I'm at right now. Isn't the idea about changing the world? Forget it. The idea about saving the world? I'm not interested. I did try and it burnt myself out. But my idea about having a life that I enjoy and I love every single day, pff, all day long. So tell me, what what um, was Brad, ten year old Brad? What was he? What was his loves? Great question. I'll show you. <clears throat> so this is my 19 space Lego. And you know, and that in itself is just beautiful. It gives me it gives me life. And I was a mad computer gamer. And when I was 1982, fine vintage, by the way. I um I used to go to Salt Coats in the good old days and uh, Aaron with my mum. And um, you know, I was into computer games and arcade games, and that my, my it was a single parent. Uh, my dad left when I was six months old. And um, and my mum brought me up, and and life was good. Life was good. But I always remember saying, like an eight, nine, ten year old playing an arcade machine, saying I'm going to get one of them. And I realised my dream of having a full size arcade machine downstairs, and it was just it gives me life every single day. It gives me life, and I realised something. That it's not just an arcade machine; it's a time machine. That's the way it's, I, it takes you back, does it? it? Takes me back, and that's what that does, and that's what all these things do. They all take me back. They all take me back. And I think that's a really interesting point in that, you know, we can't go back. We can't rewind. As much as it would be lovely to have those days back of 1983, they're gone. 
yeah. new boots gone. Yeah, shirt's gone. You know, but that that's what I think that these things do. They and I think um, you know, I look at my life and the, the the sort of material world that I've got and my home and everything compared to where I lived as as a kid. And I've done it. I've I've, I've broken the mold for my family. My um my boy Ben, he's a uh, studying geology in university. The first Burton to go to university. Well, that's, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, you know, council state kid. And yet I've got a boy who's over at Bristol Uni at the moment. Fascinating. Yeah. I always think whatever you were doing at 10 years old, you should you should be thinking about doing it now. Because mm-hmm. it Great. must have been important to you when you were two years old. At 10 years, it gave you something when you were 10 years old. So why aren't you doing it now? And it could be anything. It could be like you playing games, arcade games. It could be Lego. It could be with me. I used to love writing. I used to make up stories. You know, we had, we lived in a council house and we, at the top of the stairs, I called it a press, you know, like a big cupboard. And my mother used to just put all the junk in there. And I used to love opening that, taking out all this junk and making stories up about it. I love that. What what you would find and things. Let me show you something. This is interesting. You're talking about age. This is one of those, those those sheets that I'll just talk about. I'll come in a second. So this is, uh, it's talking about breaking down. Come on, Brad. Talk about breaking down every single one. Come on, Brad. Come on, come on, come on. Talk about breaking down every single, yeah, it's not going to go. No. Every, every single year of your life, I call it Magnificent Sevens. And it says seven, 14, 21, 28. Actually, what you was into in that time. And then I, I suggest that they do just that. So I was into Lego, go and buy some Lego. These one of the men, people that I mentor said, oh, Spice Girls. I was talking about it. And she said, yeah, I always wanted to stick a book, but could never get it. I said, go on eBay. Buy it <laughs> right now. <laughs> exactly. Yep. And I'm a terrific hoarder. I keep all the stuff that my boys loved. Oh, yeah. And I mean, um, last summer I decided, I, I, I chuck it all in the garage. And last summer I decided I was going to clear out the garage because it was yeah. just get You don't open the garage door and you couldn't even get in. There was so much. <laughs> so I got my youngest to come home and help me because I knew that he, out of the two of them, he would be the one that would say, no, get rid of it. Whereupon the older one would be like me, would be going, no, let's just keep it. <laughs> well, I um, I I went through my entire, I went through my entire um house. I went through every single room, and we decluttered everything. I put it in a pile. Keep, possibly bin, and actually we went through every single room and doing that's a really good methodology. So I've leaned my house up as best as I can. Oh well, I'm I'm getting there. I'm not there yet. I'm getting mm. there. I'm getting there slowly but surely. Mm. I try to take a Friday off. That's one of my financial freedoms is to have a Friday Beautiful. off. Beautiful. And um, me and my hubby have been going through um books because I'm a dreadful. I I just hoard books. I get that. I get that. I get that. I get that. Bookcase isn't right unless it's like creaking. You're right. Yeah, yeah. but I've got too many. I've really got too many. And we've just recently started going through CDs because we've got hundreds, oh, no, hundreds we got of rid, CDs. We, I got rid of all mine and DVDs that went. Yeah. So um, that's quite interesting, and it's actually quite good because you, then you go, "Do you remember when you bought this? Or do you remember this? Or do you remember yeah. that?" That's yeah, fascinating. yeah. And my husband's much better than me at remembering because I'll go, "No." Nah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, next question. Oh. What's your best advice for business development? Um, if I put a gun to your head right now and said to you, go and develop your business or you won't see next month, what would you do, Susan? I probably wouldn't go and develop my business. I'd probably um, chuck it all in and go and spend time with my family. No, 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 no. You have to develop your business. Otherwise, I'm going to shoot you. Okay. What would I do? Develop my business. I would find someone to um, take some of the workload off of me. And what would you do specifically? So you've got a gun to your head right now and I say, listen, I want you to do what you can today to develop your business, to move you your business forward. What would you do today? I'd probably go and hire somebody to help. You don't me. have time for hire. You've got one day. So what would you do to develop your business? Oh, my God, Brad, I don't know. Yes, you would. If, if I had a gun to your head, you'd go, oh, well, I'll ring up all the people that I'd, I'd rang in on inquiries and I'd do this and I'd do that and I'd say to you, why aren't you doing it now? 
Manchester motivation, by the way, gun to your head. But the point is, is that that's what I do. Whenever I need to find a solution, I put a gun to my head, metaphorically speaking, and said, if I had a gun to my head, what would I do in order to double my sales in the next week? I'll do this, 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 and this, this. That's the, probably the easiest way for every, any individual listening to this to be able to find out what they should be doing. And I'll give you another way as well, which works. <clears throat> Grab a piece of paper and a pen, and then I want you to write down from memory, all the people you know, so your husband, the person he goes with, the person you used to work with, clients, did it. And I just want you to write down as many names on a piece of paper as you can. And then what I want you to do, I want you to get a different color pen, and I want you to then do a value next to them. H, hot, warm, or cold. H, W, C. And everyone that's hot, transfer them to a piece of paper. Everyone that's hot, transfer them to a piece of paper. And those individuals, ring them up. Ring them up and just say hello. Steve, how are you doing? Brad, just thought I'd give you a call. Not spoke to you since the pandemic. How are you getting on? <clears throat> and just let the magic unfold. That is where I got my first, first ever clients for my business using that exercise. That's great. That's mm. really good. Because I do think, I mean, I know there's a lot of you, uh, I mean, you you must hear about artificial intelligence and how, yeah, it, use it. how it's um, all going to be taking over the world and how we all should be worried about it. But I think at the end of the day, it can't it can't take over the personal touch. So if I rang a client, like if I came off this call and I did that exercise and I started phoning around my clients, the I bet you the majority of them would be, oh my God, Susan, it's so nice to talk to you. Yes. I'm so glad you phoned because. Correct. Correct. And that's the simplicity of it. And this is what I'm trying to say. But what we end up doing is, ah, what we need to do is we need to have an automation. And we used to use MailChimp.ai. And what we need to do is this. And we need to get Facebook ads. And we need to get Pixel. And we need to get this. And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. You need to pick up the phone. How did anyone ever lose weight before Weight Watchers created Weight Watchers Spaghetti? How did anyone ever have fun? <laughs> How did anyone ever have fun? Before they made 100-inch televisions, we've made life too complicated. We've made business too complicated. And we've got to stop this and get back to basics. Yeah, yeah, it's true. It's true. So tell me a simple pleasure. <clears throat> computer games. I absolutely love computer games. I, um, Yeah, it's absolute, just a real passion of mine. There's just something about it. And uh, technology, I love technology, although... I'm now getting to that stage where I think it's going too fast. And I'm someone who's obviously of a digital generation, um, having been first generation and followed technology all the way through. I think there's something dangerous going on right now, if I'm honest, with, with AI and, and, and computing. I think it's overtaking the speed of our little minuscule human brains. You know, if I think when I was a kid, my dad brought me some stolen Encyclopedia Britannicas from the bloke in the pub. <clears throat> there was one missing, book 11. And, um, but you know, I had this entire to be doing Santa because I sit there and I'd read about stuff as a kid and be magical and showing you frogs cut out and this, that, and the other, and just, just fascinating. And now the access that you've got as a as a as an individual, as a human, is, is is greater than you can process. So I think there's a real danger right now with all that. But for me, computer games is my passion. And I also love pro wrestling. I love the theater of pro wrestling, and I actually watch pro wrestling with a view, but I look at it from the business perspective. I also look at it from the presentation perspective. So you're the, talking about WWF? There's a rival that I watch called uh, All Elite Wrestling. So I don't watch WWE. It's like Manchester United and City. So I'm at oh, AEW. Right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I'm at AEW. But what I love is it's fascinating. Is behind the curtain, the curtain's open, somebody comes out and within seconds you understand that person's personality or what they stand for. They're the good guy, they're the bad guy, the indifferent how does somebody do that from seconds that you don't know who's there? The music comes on. And I think I've, I've kind of taken that kind of showbiz element to, to my approach to, to presenting as well. Because you don't have my, the, the way that I present as a motivational speaker compared to any other speaker in the UK is fundamentally different. Like truly, there's no one like me in the UK. And I think it's because of these elements, the showbiz element and the theatre that I kind of bring to it. That's quite interesting because I was, I was watching, um, Who's that um, deaf girl, Rosie? She was on Strictly. Do you know I don't, I don't want to tell her. I don't want to tell her. So, don't oh, want to okay. Her. Anyway, she's deaf. <clears throat> and she did a programme last night about um, um, sign language versus um, um, deaf people learning to talk. Something. Mm -hmm. yep. And she'd actually done a theatre production, a Shakespeare 3, where she didn't talk. She did it all by sign language 
and facial expressions because she said right. trying to get Shakespeare in the sign language yeah. is yeah. difficult. So you have to sort of invent it. You have to show it through your face and through exactly. movement and all the rest of it, yeah. which is what you're saying, isn't it, with the wrestlers? Because yeah. as soon as they come out, how they're dressed, how they're acting, Correct. their facial expressions, and Correct. Things, you yeah. know whether it's a goodie or a baddie. Correct. And and that is, you know, and I think when I come out, I'm, I'm not sure that people know whether I'm a goodie or a baddie. And I think that's, and I recognise that, you know, I lean into it. You know, one of my first ever lines that I speak whenever I present is just to put your mind at ease, boys and girls. I am from Salford, Manchester. I do have a shaved head, do have tattoos, but don't worry, I'm not a drug dealer anymore. But we can all change, <laughs> you know. And I think it's just... So straight away, you know, this is this is quite fun because it's self-depreciating humour straight away. And yeah. every single when I come on stage, and I speak at the highest level in the UK, a mentor at the highest level, but when I come on, people go, oh, who's this dickhead? And I know that, and I lean into that. I lean into that people think, who's this clown? Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. So do you ever get overwhelmed, Brad? Yes. You do? I think, I think yeah. I think anyone does. And I think that... Um, and how do you cope with it? Recognising that it passes... Everything always passes. The key to overwhelm, and once again, I can show you that, you know, this is, I've systemized this whole process. I'm not just like making it up. I've, I've kind of got to that point in my world where I've realized that everything that you're dealing with can be, um, has been dealt with before. So once you notice it, there you go. <laughs> it's computer game logic, okay? Uh, and what I mean by that is that once you've encountered a problem, you know that next time you encounter it, how you ended up defeating it first time. So I am, um, look, here we go. So this is what I call the panic needle. Okay. Okay. So I, look, I I look at what life looks like. So I know when I'm in the green, what how I act. When I'm in the yellow, okay, I'm now getting a bit snippy. I'm now watching that I'm a bit fraught and I'm, I don't want to answer my email. And then, so by realising where you are on that panic needle, you can go, we are stepping into the red, so we need to bring it back down. Meditation, go and relax, go and have a walk, go and walk the dog, play some computer games. But what happens is most people make the mistake of trying to push through, trying to get through through the problem fast. And actually all they're doing is using what little energy they've got left and what they should be doing is stopping. When you yeah. realise you're out of control, stop moving. Most yeah. people don't want to do that. So I've kind of learned my self-taught, and I've got no degree in psychology, but, but learned psychology. And actually anyone who's got a degree has just been made up by somebody clever. So you know that's the reality of it. So I've given myself my own degree, my own personal psychology degree, in that I've, I understand what to do. And I, I kind of gauge people, I say, call them, uh, once again, another sheet here. It's so important, actually. It's amazing how I, how I fall back on these things. But one of the things that I, I do, this is, is my life check sheet. And right. what I do is it allows me, like a computer game, if you used to play a computer game, you'd see the heads-up display, I need energy, I need food, I need a better weapon. And I kind of work with people to get them to use, look at their life like a computer game. What do you need? Okay. Where can we go and get that? Is that a priority over this or is this a priority? And then working out and getting methodical. And I think that the only way that I've created this, this kind of approach that I take is through me years of playing computer games. And I think I, I think that, that sounds like to me as if you could make a computer game. Well, not a computer game out of it, but some sort of computer system app. out yeah. of it. So yeah. That's, so that's, that that's people the can step. then log in and go. Yes. This, 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 this. Okay, I'm in the red zone. I need Correct. to go and do this. And that's and that is exactly exactly what I do currently on paper. But in order to do it properly, there's no and this is the thing, I could spend twenty thousand pounds creating an app, but that's great. Grand opening, grand closing if nobody's buying it. So there's a real balancing act here between one of the things that I am doing at the moment, it's pretty much finished, is I've got a book, um, a hard copy book of these um and, and the sheets and the way to to kind of work it so that people can get their life in order. So there's not there's not sometimes I also think there's nothing like pen and paper, is there? Don't Colored like pens and paper. That's the childhood coming out again, isn't it? Listen, I get it. You don't need to explain to me. Yeah. This is the thing: is that you know we've gone too complex. We're making things far more. I, I work with clients that have got genuinely paperless offices, genuinely paperless offices. Like, what is going on? They don't have a pen in the office. I'm like, what is going on? Weird. 
I just think I think you know I'm all for saving the environment, but really, you know, you've got a BMW 3 Series outside with you know two twin turbo. I'm worried about a piece of paper and a pen. I don't know. No, I I love I love. <laughs> notebooks i've got a pile of notebooks here Love for that. various things beautiful so i've got world i've got one called world domination plan. <laughs> yeah yeah i've seen that one i've seen that one is it a pink one it's I've a green one, it's a it? green I've seen, one. I've seen, we've got a world domination one we've got a world domination funky font yeah this is my one. Oh no it's a different sort of different font yeah, yeah i got it yeah fab my world domination plans which is actually really good because it's a planner and it makes me sort of sit down and go what do I want to achieve this week? Sort of yeah, thing. I get it. And, and break it down. And then I've got another one, which is up for my clients, which is my, what I need to do for my clients. Beautiful. Beautiful. Because um, my memory is, there's too much in my head. I can't carry it all. And so I sometimes Susan. say to people, you can tell me, but if you don't want me to remember it, tell me you don't want to remember it because I can't keep everything in my head. Well, I, I, it's interesting because I have a desk which is this big. This desk was three times bigger, right? And what's happened is whatever space I've got, I'm filling. <laughs> so why was it three times bigger? So we chopped it down when my carpenter or whatever was here to set the house. I went, sh- boom, chopped it down by a third, so by, by, you know, two thirds. Yeah, and I think that's pretty much how my brain operates as well. Is that I've got something on the surface level of the table. Anything that's off that is not important to me. No, no. So I've got one final question. Mm-hmm. Tattoos. Yeah. What is it about tattoos? Why did you do them? When did you do them? And are you still doing them? No. So I have tattoos here. These are my logos, and this is a a a lion. And this is an eagle. Now, all right, okay. What was interesting about that? These are two things that I have carried throughout my life. I've got downstairs a lion, and I've got an eagle. Uh, and the You've eagle, got a lion at the back as well. Yes, a big, big time into big time into uh, lions. It gives me strength. There's an amazing story behind this piece of art, right? Which you've got thirty seconds to share it with you. But nonetheless, I um, what happened with 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 me and my um, when I moved house, 1983. Um, we had a house, my mum and my stepdad, they split up. And um, when we moved house, and I have got, I went down there recently to, to, to video outside the place. When we moved house, we was in a taxi, me and my mum. And I saw in the window of my home an eagle that I'd had. This was a plaster of Paris eagle, like full-sized eagle type thing, which was typically 1970s. And I said, mum, I want it. She went, oh, we can't. I said, mum, stop the car. And we got the eagle. And I've had the eagle since that moment. It's downstairs in my man cave downstairs. And one night, um, I got out of bed, stumbled to the toilet, and I smashed it. Oh, I no. and broke it. And I was devastated. Yeah. And for four years, for four years, I kept it in a in a container. And then I met a model maker and he's repaired it. And I have it downstairs and it's there. Oh, that's good. That's Beautiful. Good. It's an amazing story. It's an amazing story of repair. And I'll tell you something else. And the lions have always been like these, almost like my guides throughout life. And when I was going through it back in 2012, I had a nervous breakdown. I kind of got these as, as a shield to protect me. It's weird. I look back now. And, and when I got them, I took um, uh, like hardcore painkillers because I knew it was going to be like five hours of uh, painful, painful, painful. Terrible. And what happened is I was off my box on, on painkillers and the, the tattooist woman said, oh, I think these would be better longer. What do you think? And I went, oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> so she made them longer by an inch and I had to spend two years getting tattoo removal 20 sessions I have scars on on oh, there oh yeah I see it I see it yeah and also the gaps here were too tight so they blurred so I've had to spend like literally more money on the actual thingy than the... so there's a lesson here measure twice cut once <laughs> but also I think would I have tattoos now no however I think tattoos mark a moment in your life. And that was a moment of my burning the bridges yeah. because things got really tough. Let me tell you the story about this. So I was I was just spoke at um, the Crucible Theatre over in Sheffield, an absolute spectacular presentation on me, like my, probably one of my finest moments. <clears throat> we then goes to a restaurant, Pippa and I, lady who worked with me. And as we walk past the shop, I see this in the window and I yeah. stops, walks back, and it goes, oh my God. Now, price was 1100 quid. And 
my wife, there's no way in this world, if I said I'm going to spend 1100 quid, she'd hit the roof. Yeah. So I didn't, I didn't buy it. Eight months later, I'm presenting over an event over in um, in in in, in uh, Birmingham, and I've got uh, there's about 160 people that I mentored. They had a whip round, and they presented it to me. And Pippa, oh Pippa, Pippa, Pippa had had, had had said it and sorted out without telling anyone. Oh. And it's, it's it's beautiful. It gives me immense strength. It gives me immense strength when things are tough. I genuinely turn around. I just sit here in silence and look towards that, and it gives me immense strength. It's amazing. You understand that. You've always got your own out there. Yeah. It, you know, it, it give when when done correctly, art gives you life, and that's what yeah. that does. Yeah, that's nice. Isn't it a beautiful that's story? Really good. That's really good. Exceptional story. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks very much, Brad. It's been really interesting. I enjoyed that. Um, I'm so glad you accepted my invite because mm. it blew me away because I didn't think you were going to say yes. No, 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 no. You know what? I, I think you said you're really honest with me, and I think I'd be really honest with you. And like I say, all you need to do is just post it on socials, tag me, and I'll share all over as well. Great. Okay. So my name's Susan Crichton. Podcast is Small Business Financial Freedom. If you've liked this podcast, please go on and press the follow button for me. It's free. You don't need you don't need to pay anything. It's free. I'd be really grateful. Thank you.